Are we in a stock market bubble? And if we are, what should investors do about it? I'm talking today with Jeremy Grantham, who's been calling the highs and lows of market cycles for almost 50 years, having founded GMO Asset Management in 1977. You have a strong thesis about what is going on in markets right now. So why don't we begin with you just walking us through what we're seeing right now in equity markets? Historically, it's always been hard to uh, know how far a bull market can go. And value has proven to be a very weak read on which to lean mm. because value can go up and up. And I like to say the nightmare for any value manager is Japan in 1989, when um, mm. the, the price earnings ratio went to 65 times. It had never previously been over 25 until that cycle. The 2000 tech bubble was pretty uh, amazing because it broke through the previous high of 21 times earnings in 1929 and shot up to 35, which was pretty mm. brutal if you were playing against it as we were, all the way from 21 to 35. <laughs> <laughs> and we needed a pretty decent bear market uh, to look good after that and happily we got one. But Japan kept on going to 65, just to give you a warning that these things can happen. If you're gonna bet the shop, you, you better have a better, uh, indicator than value. There are some obvious examples and we should probably talk about GameStop, but uh, surely the list is pretty long at this point and maybe we ought to walk through it. GameStop is a good place to start. And that is uh, obviously uh, a, a company of very little value that uh, <laughs> was oddly picked up by uh, aggressive individuals of, with recent experience, shall we say, little experience, and, and pushed through the roof, and in the process uh, caught some short sellers in an embarrassing position and forced them to cover, which of course is always fun for the reader and painful for the hedge fund. And so we have GameStop and the retail traders, we have SPACs, surely can't avoid mentioning Tesla stock price in this context. And perhaps Bitcoin. And Hertz was a famous one from last year where a bankrupt company suddenly multiplied by five or 10 times um, with a guaranteed value of nil, as it, indeed, <laughs> as it indeed turned out to be. Tesla as an enterprise has consistently done the impossible and uh, no doubt will continue to do so. But if you're a financial analyst, you, you can push the numbers involved to justify today's price. And it is, of course, quite remarkable. And if you're a believer in market efficiency, you have a little problem here. Because while the company's sales have gone up um, between 20 and 25%, the stock price has gone up 700%, or it's multiplied by eight times. So which one was efficient? Was it efficient a year ago uh, before COVID? or is it efficient today? But you can't have both. So one of those two numbers was gloriously inefficient. I do wanna go back to the Fed and monetary policy. It seems like your view is very straightforward. The monetary operations of the Fed have done little for the economy and have done much to inflate a potentially destabilizing bubble. Is it, is it that simple? We would be better yes. off without a Fed? at all in this circumstance? We'd be better off with a Fed that had the simple instruction to try and maintain a steady increase in the money supply in relationship to the GDP, period. Mm -hmm. And all, all its fancy obligations are uh, misplaced, misdesigned. And I have a simple experiment, which I love. It shows debt to GDP ratio in the US climbing back from post-World War II slowly rising across the page uh, imperceptibly until you reach Greenspan. There is simply no proof that debt mm. increases growth. There is a convention that it does. So 
when we've spoken in the past, Jeremy, you've been pretty confident that the reversal is coming soon uh, this year. Predicting the future is a beast. We, we know that. <laughs> and uh, we're <clears throat> kind of limited as historians to, to the history that we have. And, and we've been favored by a few wonderful demonstrations of crazy investor behavior. But amongst mm. the serious bubbles, Japan yes. is far and away in a class of its own. The apparent old wives tale that the land under the Empress Palace was worth more than the entire state of California. We spent two days looking at it and it was true. This was not an old <laughs> wives tale. This was a, an unbelievable uh, commentary yes. on the land values of downtown Tokyo. <laughs> anyway, that was Japanese land, the biggest bubble in history. Ja Japanese stock markets, the biggest equity bubble in history, followed by 2000 and, and, and uh, 2021, in my opinion. So we've had a little set of these, and they all have one thing in common. They are all characterized by accelerating price uh, above the average of the bull market, and they are all characterized by increasing craziness and by investing, as I say, going onto the front page, going into the cocktail party, intruding in the lunchtime uh, television show. Uh, and we have checked off every one of those. Now, if this wants to break, break out and make a new branch of history, uh, it can do that. It, nothing is ever certain. This thing could go on for years and years and, and uh, Bitcoin could become like a Rembrandt masterpiece worth exactly <laughs> what somebody wants to pay for. But if history means to repeat itself as a general principle, I've always made a fuss that each bubble is different. What you're looking for is just the spirit of the exercise. Is it crazy? Is it accelerating? And when it gets into that mode, the mode that we have been in for a few weeks, it has always lasted no more than a few months. Let me play devil's advocate then. The, the people who remain bullish make the following argument, which you've I'm sure heard a million times, which is bond yields are incredibly low and the difference between government bond yields and the uh, return on stocks is actually historically normal. The Fed has the power to keep those bond yields low. Uh, and therefore, that relationship will hold and stock valuations will stay high. There's a two levels of response. The, the meta level is you don't think a bubble peak occurs with a background of pessimism, it, it doesn't. It, it occurs <laughs> when, you, when you have a perpetual bull story, uh, that something is a new high plateau in 1929, that Alan Greenspan's uh, 2000 market, that the internet is going to drive away the dark clouds of ignorance forever, and we will have forever higher productivity, he argued. He got almost nothing right in my opinion, by the way. <laughs> but every, every bull market has a permanent story. Lovely profit margins, abnormally high in 1929, in 2000. In, in every one of them in Japan will last forever because the conditions that got them there will last forever. A lot of market commentators and investors make the argument that a spike in inflation or inflation expectations is the only thing that can pop this balloon. You don't seem to take that view. You don't think, it, you, you seem to think that um, a spike in inflation might be sufficient, but is not necessary to crack this market. That, that's well, well put, thank you. Um, that's completely my view. Um, but to back up a, a second, uh, to use an asset class that is the most overpriced it has ever been, where 20% of sovereign bonds have a negative real return, and they guarantee to take some of your money 
uh, over the 10 or 30 years that you give them your money. It's pretty bizarre. And it's ex absolutely without historical precedent. To use that as the yardstick and say, well, US stocks aren't any more overpriced than the most overpriced bond market in history by a lot is an odd way uh, to determine value. Why not use Bitcoin? Hey, relative to Bitcoin, the US looks really cheap. I I'd buy some more if I were you. It, it is a ludicrous idea uh, uh, to use a highly overpriced asset as a benchmark of any kind. Yes, we're in a desperate situation in the US because we have an extraordinarily overpriced bond market coinciding with an extraordinarily overpriced stock market. That doesn't make me feel better. That makes me feel worse. It should make me feel worse. It means a 60-40 portfolio is, is doomed to have a terrible 10, 20 year return from here. It seems like we are now living in a market over a period of decades that's nothing more or less than a succession of bubbles. 2000, 2008, now 2020. In, in that kind of, back, with that kind of backdrop, it seems to me that active management becomes uh, very difficult and, the, and outperforming, uh, say the S&P 500, becomes a matter of accurately timing market tops and bottoms more than almost anything else. Uh, do you think, do you think uh, active management can outperform over the long term uh, anymore? You know, the G I know you don't manage GMO anymore, but you know, the, the core GMO US equity fund is about tied with the S&P since 1985. Is that as good as a, an equity fund can do? There are, um, there's always uh, one way uh, to run a portfolio and that is to uh, predict the future on a stock by stock basis and to do it slightly better uh, than the marketplace. Um, the marketplace is often pretty good. Uh, the marketplace is occasionally ludicrously wrong. Um, the actual present value of the long-term stream of dividends would justify a very steady progression of the market since 1925 when we did the data. Uh, ebbing and flowing only 1% here or there. The reality is that, as we know, is that it ebbs and flows. It turns out 17 times more volatile than is justified by the clairvoyant stream of dividends. So we have designed a marketplace to be more a measure of hysteria than a measure of value. It's completely overwhelmed on occasions by, by the psychology of crowds. Now, in between these every 10 or 20 year speculative events, the market can be pretty close to fair value, can do a pretty decent job. Uh, the paradox is that the only time that really matter in portfolio management are, are these deviations from fair value. Sometimes they're on the down, downside. The, my, my favorite all time letter was called Reinvesting When Terrified, which we we published the day by luck, the day the market hit its low in, in, in 2009. And, and, and we said, you know, get your act together. The market's being crushed. You can have double digit returns for a long time. Get your program together, get it in front of your, your committee and, and start getting, getting yourself, dragging yourself back into the market. And of course you feel paralyzed. Why wouldn't you? Our conditions are very bad. And I, I made the point then that the market doesn't stop when it sees light at the end of the tunnel. The market actually turns when everything is really black, but it's a subtle shade less black than it was the day before. And the same here at the top. The market doesn't, doesn't turn when something really bad happens. It turns on the second most optimistic day for the last 20 years, but it's a little less optimistic than it was yesterday. And by the middle of the following week, a little less optimistic, and the next month, a little less optimistic again. 
And then you begin to uh, realize that the game has changed. That, that really hit the spot. Thank you. Bye-bye.